Come one, come all. All are welcome to hear my tales, be you tall, short, wide, thin, old, young, rich and poor. All are welcome, as long as you don't spit, swear, poke me in the eye, kick me in the leg, or hook your fingers up me nose and lead me round the garden like a pig. I'll have none of that. Come and hear tales that will make you laugh so much, your insides will become your outsides. Come and hear tall tales of high adventure, small tales of low cunning, and tales of about that height there. Three foot six by my estimation, although I have been known to be wrong. For good day to you all. My name is Day Tong, sometimes called the Yarnsmith of Norwich. I wander the road bringing wonder wherever I go. Or more correctly at the moment, I wander me garden grumbling wherever I go. And so it's quite nice. Quite nice? No, it's really nice to be back here at the World Storytelling Cafe sharing stories again with all of you. And I've got three stories for you this day. The first is ancient. First set down, first written in Anglo-Saxon a thousand years ago. The second is much earlier still. It's a Norse myth, a silly one. And I've got another story that many say is Saxon. It takes place in the far west of my county, Norfolk. We share it with the fair and fine folk of Cambridgeshire, just over the border. It's not a strange and dark place. It's all right, really. But we must begin at the beginning of the Anglo-Saxon tale, first written down a thousand years ago. It's a story of Beowulf. Many of you will have heard of him. You will know how he found fame fighting and killing a terrible night stalker, a cruel creature, a creature called Grendel. How, when he attacked the halls of King Hrothgar, King of the Danes, Beowulf leapt upon its back. They wrestled thither and yon. He took hold of the creature's arm, pulling it back harder and harder, tighter and tighter, until there was a tearing of flesh, a snapping of sinew, a crunching of bone. Beowulf tore off Grendel's arm, and the creature ran, screaming and dying into the night. And you'll know how then Beowulf killed Grendel's mother as well, and so he found fame as a, a ferocious warrior. And in time he became a king, king of the Geats. He ruled his people for 50 years. For 50 years, for 50 summers, he ruled with strength of arm. For 50 winters, he ruled with wisdom of head. But now he was an old man. His back was bent, his beard was so long it dusted the floor as he walked along. Yet still the old king had one more battle to fight before he could sleep soundly in his bed. But my story doesn't start in the time of King Beowulf. It starts 500 years before he was even born. 500 years before he was a twinkle in his father's eye, a flutter in his mother's swelling belly. For at that time... There lived a chieftain, a lesser king, you might say. So too a lesser man, because he sired ten sons, ten princes, I suppose you would call them. But he wasn't a good father, for each was more cruel. Each was more vicious than the one that went before. For each robbed from his people, took from his enemies, until they had amassed a great hoard of treasure in their father's hall. But as the treasure, it grew and it grew and it grew, so too the greed in their hearts, it grew and it grew and it grew. For each of them wanted the coin for their own. And so it was, they drew their swords, they attacked the others, until nine of them lay dead. Even the old king, the chieftain, he too was slain. One of them was left. He became the new chieftain of that land. Still, he robbed from his people, he took from his enemies. Until the hoard of treasure was so big it hardly fit in his halls. And he too was an old man with a bent back and a beard so long it dusted the floor as he walked along. And it was said that as an old man a, a dark shadow passed across his heart. Some believed it was because he felt shame at last for having killed his brothers, having killed his father, the old chieftain. But it was not. It was simply the realisation that now he was an old man with far less of the road in front of him than he had behind. Soon he realised he would die. And having had no children, there was no one to protect the horde when he was gone. What could he do? 
he had an idea, a simple one. He ordered his servants go out into the land to search for a hiding place. They searched and they searched until one of them, he found a great cave set high in a rocky cliff face. He returned and told the king and quickly, well, he ordered that all of that hoard of gold, silver and jewels, they all be taken and hidden there. And no sooner was it done than the old chieftain, the old king, he ordered his soldiers slit the throats of all the servants who had carried the treasure so none could tell where it was hidden. But then the cruel king, he too died. He went like that. No sooner had he died than his enemies attacked his halls. They stripped it down stone by stone, carved column by carved column. But not one silver coin, not one jewel could they find. And so it was the treasure of the ten princes it became, but a story to be told around the fire on a, a cold winter's night. But know, my friends, that then there came a dragon to this land. Its wings outstretched like the sails of a Viking longship. Its hard scaly body glowing green, then blue, then red, then golden, lit by the fire that burned deep inside its belly. The great worm, it found the entrance to the cave. It wriggled and slivered inside. It found the great hoard of treasure. And as I'm sure all of you know, leastways all of you who are steeped in dragon lore, Dragons love gold most of all. Its eyes sparkling like the jewels that surrounded it. It heaved its great worm-like body up on top. It curled around and around. The great and dangerous dragon, the dark beast, it, it folded back its wings. And it slept the deep, deep and sweet, sweet sleep of a happy and contented dragon. For there it slept for five hundred years. And you know what, being older myself, sometimes I wish I could sleep for 500 years. But no, my friends, there were some, like all of you gathered here this day, who still loved stories. There were some who still believed the story of the treasure of the ten princes. They knew, as I know, that there is a little nugget of truth wrapped up in a whole lot of lies in every story. There was one lad who decided he would go and look for it. He searched and he searched and he searched. He devoted his life to it. Until now he was an old man with a bent back and a beard so long. It dusted the floor as he walked along. When finally he found the entrance to the cave, he crawled inside. He found the treasure. He found the great wicked worm that guarded it. He was terrified you would be, wouldn't you? But still he was taken by greed. For he stooped down and he picked up a golden cup. A cup like that one there, shiny. He thought, I do not think a dragon has need of a golden cup. I do not think a dragon will miss this one cup from this great hoard. And so it was the thief hid the golden cup beneath his coat and he was gone, quick as you like. You know something, my friends, old men in my stories, they can't ask shift when they want to. Well, I ask you, was he right? I'm sure most of you, at least all of those who are steeped in dragon law, will know that of course he was not right. For no sooner had he gone than the dragon awoke. He tasted the air. He could taste his enemy man. Casting his eyes around the treasure, he saw that a golden cup had been stolen. With a great roar, he wriggled and writhed out of the cave. He unfurled those wings. He flew up high into the sky. He swooped down low, seeking the thief, seeking anyone to punish for the crime for he sent great tongues of flame down upon the people's crops down upon their cattle he sent great sheets of flame down upon the people's houses down upon the people and such was their wailing and woe such was their grief it reached the ears of their king old Beowulf. he realised that he must defeat this dark and dangerous dragon if his people were to be safe and so it was he summoned his blacksmith to him, the man of iron, the man who made weapons of war and, and many un, un, other wonderful things. Beowulf ordered that he make a great metal shield as tall as a man. This was strange, because at this time shields tended to be small and round, made of wood, covered in leather. 
Beowulf's men thought the old king had gone a bit mad. But still they were wary of him, and they did not say. As all of them mounted their horses, and they rode off to the mountain, where the dragon slept soundly once more. And when they arrived, Beowulf's many warriors, they stood up on the high rocky cliff face, as the old king climbed down, down, down to the cave. With that great heavy shield upon his back, his heavy sword by his side, it was hard work. And when at last Beowulf got to the bottom, he sat down in front of the cave, sitting on a rock, much as I am sitting on a log this day. And as he did, he pondered upon many things. He wondered if he would ever feel the salt sea breeze against his face again. He wondered if he would ever hear the shouts of his men in battle, or their songs of victory in his great hall. And he feared he would not. And so, with aching bones and an aching heart, he stood up. He took his shield in one hand, he took his sword in the other, and now he beat hard three times. And between the beats on the drum, he called the name of the dragon. Now at this point, my friends, I'm going to let you into a little secret. Although I've been telling stories for many years, I'm not known as a lazy storyteller. I don't like shouting that loudly. I speak loudly, but not shout loudly. So you're going to have to shout the name of the dragon. Now, at this point, if we were face to face, I would get some of you to, to give me suggestions for the dragon's name and we would vote. Normally, the dragon ends up being called Bob or Kevin. But with this day, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to call him Dragon. You know what you got to do when I stop beating upon my shield? You've got to call Dragon. Let's give it a go. Not bad, but you can do better. Oh, I think you can do better than that. Dragons, well, they're like old men. They sleep soundly, although they're very grumpy when they wake up. I'll warn you of that now. We call that foreshadowing. One more time, I want you to shout so loud that the good people of Norwich in Norfolk, where I live, or near where I live, they all turn in your direction, wherever you are in the world, and they all go, what was that? Here we go. Are you ready? The dragon awoke, for he knew the voice of his enemy. He knew the voice of man. He came wriggling and writhing out of his cave. And seeing the old King Beowulf standing there, the dragon raised itself up. It sent great sheets of flame down upon the old king. Flames so hot it should have burnt the flesh from his bones. Flames so hot it wrapped itself around the king like a great red cloak. Luckily he was shielding behind that great iron shield. But still he felt the strength leaving him as, as water runs from a hill. The dragon fell upon Beowulf. He saw his chance. Beowulf raised his sword, bringing it down hard upon the scaly neck of the dragon. But as I'm sure all of you know, leastways those who are steeped in dragon lore, dragon scales are hard. And so it was. The wound the sword made, it was not deep. It only served to make the dragon fiery and twisted in his anger, as once more he fell upon King Beowulf. And so it was, the sight that met his men's eyes up on the rocky cliff face above. It made terror well in their hearts. Men who before that day had been brave in battle, all ran for the safety of the woods, all save one. A young warrior, new to the king's service, called Wiglaf. No, my friends, at Wiglaf wasn't about to see the king die alone. He fought his way down through heat and smoke to stand shoulder to shoulder, side by side with the king. Again, the great fire-breathing drake, it cast flame down upon them both. Flame so hot, it burnt through Wiglaf's wooden shield. Flame so hot, it would have burnt the flesh from his bones, had not old Beowulf leapt in front of the young warrior with the great metal shield. Again, the dragons fell upon them. Beowulf saw his chance, bringing the sword down hard upon the dragon's bony skull. But that sword, that had served him well for fifty years, 
it broke upon the dragon's hard head. And with it broke the last of the old king's resolve, as the dragon snatched him up, raising Beowulf on high, swinging him backwards and forwards, thither and yon, his fierce fangs sinking in deep. But it was now that Wiglaf saw his chance, for as the dragon raised up Beowulf on high, it exposed its belly. And as I'm sure you all know, leastways all of you who are steeped in dragon lore, dragon bellies are soft, softer than the rest of them anyway. And so it was, Wiglaf, with his own sword in burnt and blackened hand, he stepped forward, he thrust his sword deep, fist deep into the belly of the dragon. The great beast shivered. It shuddered. It came crashing to the ground, dead. But this was to be no cause for celebration, for there lay old King Beowulf, still with his broken sword clutched in his fists, his body beginning to swell from the poison passed from the dragon's bite. He could feel his blood beginning to boil in his veins. And so it was, he drew Wiglaf close. He ordered the young warrior go into the cave and fetch some of the hoard so that the old king could see that which had killed him. Quickly, Wiglaf did as he was ordered. He brought gold, silver, jewels, ornaments cunningly wrought long ago. And Beowulf looked upon them and he smiled a sad smile. Drawing Wiglaf closer, he ordered that when he had died, for he knew his time was short, that Wiglaf must build a great funeral pyre of wood, that he must burn Beowulf's body, and that the ashes they must be buried deep beneath a rocky barrow, a rocky mound, set high on the rocky cliff face to, to serve as a warning to ships. And then old Beowulf passed from this life. He was gone. His men came down from the cliff, shamefaced, but they knew what must be done. A funeral pyre was built. Beowulf's body was placed upon it. It burned for what seemed like many days. And when finally the ash was cooled, it was gathered up. It was buried beneath a rocky mound. But know, my friends, that Beowulf's remains did not lie low. Something else was buried beneath that barrow, that great rocky mound with him. And of course... It was the treasure of the ten princes, buried deep beneath those rocks, so that no man would fight for it. No man would die for it, ever, ever again. And there ends my first story, my friends. A sad tale, I think you'll agree. But know this, as a storyteller of many years' experience, I can tell you that where there's a sad story, a silly one is often lurking nearby. So we're going to have a bit of a daft Norse tale now. But we're not going to have it here. We're going to go on a bit of a journey. We're going to go somewhere else slightly better suited to the tale I wish to tell. And so if you're ready, we shall go now. Fair or not, I'm going to do all the walking along the railway line. All you have to do is blink and we'll be going. What do you think of me oak tree? That's why I've brought you here. I say my oak tree, of course it's not really my oak tree. That tree will be here long after I'm dead and gone. For in terms of oak trees, it's still quite a young one. It's only about 250 to 300 years old by my estimation. Although I have been known to be wrong. And this oak tree, well, oak trees, they have uh, lots of associations with the sacred, with gods and goddesses of long ago. And I brought you here because it has a particular link, link to a, a certain Norse god of a thunder. I've also brought you here because I just love oak trees. They are strong and mighty, just like the god in my tale. I wonder, can you guess who the story's going to be about? Have a think about it and blink your eyes one more time. Go on then. I told you I was going to tell you a story about a Norse god of thunder and lightning, so of course it can only be Thor. 